um, there was a center organizing all these events. We we were Paul invite people to come back to be uh, within this community of Dharma. So thank you, Bhante, and thank, thank you, Fan. Thank you, Fan, for this kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Chris, for organizing all this and inviting me to lead the prayer service and the talk and the guided meditation this evening. Um, so let me first pay homage to the Buddha in Pali, and we will start after that. <clears throat> Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Namo tasse bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasse. Namo tasse bhagavato Hato Samma Sam Buddhasse. Homage to him, the blessed one, the fortunate one, and the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So today, um, I hear that uh, we will also include in this service uh, two names were suggested by Chris Charles uh, Charlie. Um, this evening, he's a volunteer of uh, TCAB, and his dad is going to have surgery early next week. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure how much of that information I was supposed to share, but now everybody knows. <laughs> Um, but we will all pray um, together and also we will include Cody uh, Mancaster uh, also uh, is sick and um, uh, they were going to join tonight but um, I think because they are not well they are not here with us so with them and uh, okay let me admit this one person <clears throat> And whoever else is not feeling well, or whoever else you like to remember, uh, can be included in our initial prayers. Let me share the screen. And this is a prayer I, uh, I developed during my time in Brigham and Women's Hospital. This is called the Buddhist Prayer for Healing, and the the director there printed uh, about hundreds of these and started giving away to patients. Um, so uh, then th at the time I worked in uh, St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Auckland, uh, in Michigan, they also printed this and started sharing. So if you go to the blogs, uh, the, uh, the bantekusala.blogspot.com, you have it available for free um, and you can use it anytime and I made a little video of it and uh, it's also available in my YouTube channel um, and somebody's happened to download it and during when when the pandemic started it appears that you know in WhatsApp they started sharing that video with everyone and some patients found it very helpful so um, I trust that you can read what I am seeing here. So, but uh, what I'm going to do is, you know, include all these um, people that we pray for, um, for their good health and uh, longevity and healing with them in mind. Let us um, all, whatever way you want to join, maybe join farms or uh, closed, uh, closed eyes, so whatever way you like to join with, uh, with this, you can join and just feel free and I will begin now. <clears throat> with the blessings of the sacred qualities of the Buddha, I pray that you will be healed in every breath you take, feel fresh in every morning you wake. May you be free from all fears, May you be free from all illnesses. 
may no harm come to you. May you live peacefully without any trouble. Whatever is broken in your body, may it be mended. May all inflammations be removed and infections be cleansed. Let the warmth of the Buddha's healing love pass through your body to renew your life. May the light, limitless loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity guard your way toward good health. May you see these qualities in nurses, doctors, friends, family, and whoever tends to you. May you have wisdom to detach from suffering and not identify with any pain. May your spiritual friends give you wise advice and take you in the direction of liberation from all sufferings. May there be every blessing. May all heavenly beings protect you through the power of all Buddhas teachings and noble monks. May you be well, may you be at peace, may you be loved, cared for, and cured. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So this prayer has, you know, part in, um, this is, you know, although you see the English translation, some of it also is uh, in Pali language. So I would chant like Bhavatu Sabda Mangalam, Rakhantu Sabda Devata, Sabda Buddha Nubhavena, Sada Sutti Bhavantu Te, Bhavatu Sabda Mangalam, Rakhantu Sabda Devata, Sabda Dhamma Nubhavena, Sada Sutti Bhavantu Te. Bhavatu sabh mangalam, rakhantu sabh devata, sabh sangha nubhavena, sada suddhi bhavantu te. Sabhiti yo vivajjantu, sabh rogo vinasatu, mate bhavatvantarayo, Sukhi dighayuko bhava. So with that, I like to um, invite you all to join me in a guided meditation session, holding space for whoever you want to hold this space for and making a connection with whatever the sacred you hold as sacred in your life. So let us prepare ourselves for this guided meditation. Please close your eyes and sit comfortably. Breathe in peace. Breathe out, let go. Peace. Let go. Whatever is weighing on you, feel free to let them go. Let it go. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Please scan your body from head to toes, releasing any negativity and relaxing. Mm -hmm. 
While you breathe in and breathe out, please relax your head, relax your forehead, relax your eyes, relax your face, keeping a gentle smile on your lips. Relax the back of your head. Relax your neck. Relax your shoulders. Relax your arms, palms and fingers. Relax your chest. Relax your back keeping your back straight. Relax your sitting bones. Relax your knees. Relax your shin bones. Relax your ankles. Relax your soles the soles of your feet. Relax your toes. <clears throat> Feel free to cough or do anything that naturally arises during this meditation without struggling to prevent them. Now you are grounded, deeply rooted and well balanced on this earth, moving away from agitations of your body, you come to observe the full life of your breath and begin breathing in mindfully and breathing out mindfully. Slowly and gradually you arrive at peace. This breath is happening now. The breath is not happening in the past or in the future. This breath is happening right now. Since your eyes are closed, you can see your ears only pay attention to these instructions. Your nose isn't looking for fragrances. Your tongue is also not occupied. Your body and mind, these are getting calmer and arriving at peace, letting your brain to relax, the nervous system to remain calm. Mindfully, you breathe in. Mindfully you breathe out, whether your breath is short or long, you are aware as this as they happen.
long or short breath, you notice it and stay with it. Inhaling or exhaling, you are there with your breath. Sensitive to this full body, whole body, you breathe in and breathe out, noticing the body's movements with breath, shoulders moving and you feeling calmer with each breath. You breathe in mindfully and breathe out. Now you can let go of this breath in such a way that you feel like your body's parts are disappearing. Your body, the weight of it is no longer felt in you. You feel light, you feel calm, you feel relaxed. But the breath comes back and starts getting active again in your body and you allow it to. Breath becomes very, very subtle. Enjoying this relaxed state, you breathe in and you breathe out. Enjoying freedom from sense doors, you breathe in and breathe out. Enjoying the freedom from worries and troubles, you breathe in and breathe out. You arrive at peace and stillness, calmness, and joy of letting go, happiness of letting go, a place where there is peace, where you feel like you are in, in a sanctuary, no work, weighing on you, free.
if you want to remember the smile of those who departed from your life someone who's dear to you feel free to do so imagine them smiling and happy accomplished and free from any pain relaxed and ready to transition from wherever they are to a happier, greater place and existence. You aren't holding them with your tears, with your heavy grief, you are letting them go, letting them be free, allowing them to move on, saying, I am doing fine. Do not worry about me. It is okay to let me go. May you find a happy home in Sansar, in the cycle of birth and death. May you lack no food, may you be fulfilled with shelter, clothing, and all your medicinal and nutriments needs. May there be spiritual companions leading you toward ultimate peace and liberation from all sufferings. May no harm come to you. May you live long wherever you happen to be, free from karma, free from enemies, free from greed, hatred and delusion. May your birth be a fortunate one by the power of the merits earned through this meditation, may you be well, happy, and peaceful. May you be born among the heavenly deities, heavenly beings. May they receive you like a dear friend and offer you with heavenly rewards or even go to greater lengths, greater realms, to Brahma realms, where you are happier, at peace, with more rewards, or even if you let go of that, may you attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. freedom from all sufferings without holding on to any birth whatsoever, any karma whatsoever.
Now you can come out of this meditation. <clears throat> Let us chant the Metta Sutta. This is great way to radiate friendliness in the universe. And this is also a meditation that you can do anytime and that you can pray daily. Um, and the, you are the first person to benefit from it. First, I'll do it in English and then in Pali. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety, May all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, are meeting none. The great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding to fixed views. The pure hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Karaniya matta kusale na yantang santang padang abhisamitcha sakko yucha sujucha suvacho chasa muduvanatimani santusa kocha subharocha apakichocha sallauka butti Santindriyo cha nipako cha apagabho kule suvananugiddho Nacha kuddhaṁ samachare kinchi ena vinyo pare upavadeyum Sukhino vake nino hontu sabbe satta bhavantu sukhitatta 
ಅನವಶೇಷಾವಾಯ ಮಹಂತಾ ಮಧ್ಯಮಾರಸ್ಕಾನುಕೂಲಿಷ್ಟಾಯ ದೂರೆ ವಸಂತಿಯೂರೆ ಭೂತಾವಸಂಭವೇಶಿವಸಿತ್ತ ನಾತಿ ಮನೇಥ ಕಥಚಿನ ಕಂಚಿ ದ್ಯಾರೋಸ ನಪತಿ ಸನ್ಯಮನ್ಯಸ್ಖೇಯ ಮಾತಾಯಥಾನಿಯುಷಾಯುತ್ತಮನುರಖೇ ಸಬ್ಬೂತು ಮಾನಸಂಭಾವೇಪರಿಮಾನ ಮಿತ್ತಂಚಸೋಕಸ್ಮಸಂಭಾವೇಪರಿಮಾನ ಉದ್ಧಂಗೋಚತಿರ್ಯಂಚಸಂಬಾಧಂಗೇರಂಗಸಪತ್ತಿಂಗಧಿಷ್ಠೇಯ್ರಹ್ಮೇತಂಗ
the Buddha explained this to Bimbisara, who thereupon gave alms in the name of the hungry ghosts, thus making them happy. It was on this occasion that the sutta was preached. So, Tirukuddha has a meaning, you know, it means, you know, outside the wall. So, let me kind of give an idea of the content of the sutta. It's a very, it's not that long. So the Buddha says, outside the walls they stand, and at crossroads, at door post they stand. So they means those who have departed, returning to their old homes sometimes. But when a meal with plentiful food and drink is served, no person remembers them. Such is the karma of those beings. Thus, those who feel sympathy for their dead relatives give timely donations of proper food and drink, acquisite, clean thinking. May this be for our relatives. May our relatives be happy. And those who have gathered there, the assembled shades of the relatives with appreciation give their blessing. So they in turn bless you for the plentiful food and drink. May our relatives live long because of whom we have gained this gift. We have been honored and the donors are not without reward. For there, in their realm, there is no farming, no herding of cattle, no commerce, no trading with money. They live on what is given here hungry shades, those time, whose time here is done. As water raining on a hill flows down to the valley, even so does what is given here benefit the dead. As rivers full of water fill the ocean full, even so does what is given here benefit the dead. He gave to me, she acted on my behalf, they were my relatives, companions, friends. Offerings should be given for the dead. When one reflects thus on things done in the past, for no weeping, no sorrowing, no other lamentation benefits the dead, whose relatives persist in that way. But when this offering is given, well placed in the Sangha, it works for their long-term benefit and they profit immediately. In this way, the proper duty to relatives has been shown. Great honor has been done to the dead, and monks have been given strength. The merit you have acqu acquired isn't small. So by giving merit, you earn merit too. So this is basically uh, where the idea of you know sharing merits come and when somebody has passed away um, we remember them in sri lankan culture we remember them on you know we do the funeral service where we talk about them the good qualities of them and there is a series of rituals we do and I will walk you through these rituals using these slides I found helpful. So, well, as we understand death and dying in Buddhism, um, we understand that there is sansara, which is the cycle of birth and death, and three marks of existence, which is about impermanence, you know, anicca and suffering, dukkha and non-self nature, anatta. And we also understand the teaching of karma, you know, the good things you do uh, bring you into greater, better results and the bad things you do, you inherit them and you also get the vipaka, the results of the bad things. So, Looking at death rituals, you know, is important because all these have different meanings. 
in different cultures. So in Buddhist culture, you know, dying moment is super important. At that time, you know, some wise, you know, relatives, if they happen to be around, they will say, don't cry there, let them go, you know. Um, you can cry maybe in a bathroom or some other place later, but right now, um, you know, remind them of the good things they did. You remember you did a, you did a wonderful charity work, you did, you, you gave dana, meaning you offered to monks, um, you offered food, uh, you went on a pilgrimage, you uh, visited the places um, that are important in Buddha's life, such as the place of birth, place of enlightenment, place of passing away, um, and all these, you know, you have seen, and the place of his first sermon of the Buddha. So these last moments, you know, when you are a good companion, you will be telling them about these things instead of, you know, um, torturing them with your grief. <laughs> your grief can, can torture them in a way that how can this person survive without me? Instead, you know, if you can give the idea that, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine, you know, I'm very strong and I know how to manage, uh, you don't have to worry about me. So that message can be given in different ways. So, so the last thoughts of an individual shape their future rebirth. That is kind of believed in, in Buddhist culture. <clears throat> in spite of, you know, they have their own karma they have done. And sometimes if, uh, if that karma is very strong, it is hard for us to rescue them, but you can still try. You can talk about heaven. You can talk about freedom from even any hell realms. And you can talk about freedom from poverty, like, you know, focus on, um, greater wealth and a greater happiness in your mind and focus on heavenly rewards, how happy, how joyful you can be by letting go of this ailing body and this suffering, this illness, this cancer or whatever, you will be finally free. And uh, you can also talk about um, letting go of um, any realm, no birth at all and final freedom. But we need to be careful about uh, this, this language, you know. I remember once uh, when we wanted to make, you know, prepare a prayer, you know, they have been praying for those uh, patients who did uh, stem cell transplants. And in that, uh, there was a prayer, Buddhist prayer they prayed when it happened to be a Buddhist patient. And I saw it and I said, no, don't pray like this. You know, we don't, <laughs> don't do this after today because it said something so depressing, something like these impermanent cells came from an impermanent body and will go to your impermanent body and uh, things like that. You know, that's very, that's not how we use Buddhism. It's like, you know, it's just like you, you talk to a friend, you know, May your body be receptive to these cells and may you heal, may you feel better, may you have the energy. So that's a common language and that's, that's like mental boost, booster, giving them the support and strength, you know. They don't need to be reminded of impermanence or suffering or anything, you know, in their ailing, uh, in their sick moments, you know. That is like slapping them with their own illness, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we try to eliminate that language and just uh, say something nice only when you know the person so well and that they only need to be reminded of them impermanence and uh, all these Buddhist technical terms, then, you know, because they want it, then you will talk about it. If they say, okay, chant metta sutta, then you will chant it. You know, if they say, 
chant the Satipatthana Sutta, which is common in monks' funerals. When a monk has passed away for seven days, they play the Satipatthana Sutta in Sri Lanka in, on a loudspeaker, so everybody hears it. Those who understand it learn or, you know, has it as a reminder for them to establish uh, mindfulness based in all those four ways. So that is uh, only when a monk has passed away, but not when a lay person has passed away. So, but there is this grief. It doesn't matter, you know, whether, you know, even when um, monks experience the death of their own parents, sometimes they cry. And that this is normal, you know. Grief is the measure of your love toward the person who died. You know, grief comes as conditions are present. And when these conditions disappear, grief disappear. So how can we control it? You know, sometimes people stay not crying until the end of the funeral day. And in privacy, they start crying because the thoughts of these people come to their mind. The moments come in as, you know, as a natural response, the holes of your eyes will bring up tears and, and you accept it. That is totally fine. But uh, we try to be careful at the dying moment uh, to help them to strengthen their uh, future existence. So what happens after death, you know? Um, so different traditions hold different views. In Tibetan Buddhism, after the last last breath is taken, the the individual is in an immediate intermediate state between their previous life and their new life. Uh, this state, known as the bado, can last up to forty nine days. In Theravada Buddhist tradition, rebirth is immediate. However, you know customs and rituals in Theravada countries. You know, in Sri Lanka, Thailand, Laos suggest that in practice, most Buddhists believe in some forms of intermediate state for of up to seven days or maybe three months or until um, you, you are in a good place so that they can be free and go away. I remember once when I, I had two students in, in that Pali class. One of them was a Christian student and uh, like a middle-aged person in his uh, uh, 50s. And um, that day in the morning around 10 o'clock in Sri Lanka, he came to the class with his friend and said, um, Bhante, um, uh, can we skip the class for today? And uh, uh, can we do something else? And I asked, you know, what is that? You know, my <clears throat> mother-in-law, died and uh, i feel like she's still around you know uh, there is a mattress in our home and she loved me and i can sleep and in, in that mattress in in her bed but when we give that mattress to visitors you know they complain saying somebody pushed us you know couldn't sleep things like that happened and these are strange and sometimes my daughter in Singapore, she can eat. She complains about, you know, different problems, um, feeling not well, and all this started, and we are worried, you know, can you help us? And I said, okay, let's go to your house. So we went, it was about, took us about 45 minutes to get there. And uh, this was in Candy City. So I walked to the house and I said, you can buy some food or you can, whatever the food you have, you can offer to me and I will have it. And I will chant the Metta Sutta and Mangala Sutta and the Ratana Sutta. So Metta Sutta is about loving kindness. Mangala Sutta is about auspicious things. Ratana Sutta is about uh, the three jewels, the triple gem. So I chanted it 
and I asked them to speak about her good qualities and they said you know she was a Catholic but she read Buddhist books all her life later you know toward the end of her life she listened to many talks in Dhamma um, and so I, I, I too like after chanting and I had I had a, a pot of water you know we had hold it during the chanting I started sprinkling water in the house so, and then I went to the room where she stayed. It was a little dark. And I said, see, you have been a wonderful person. Um, you have listened to Dhamma. You have been reading Buddhist books. And you don't have to stay in this place. You know, you can find a happier place. And that's all I said. And um, um, I thanked her for her life. And I, I ended all my services and I went to the temple. And that evening they called me and said, Bhante, my daughter from Singapore, Singapore called us and said today she felt hungry for the first time and she ate a good meal. And we will tell you if, um, you know, if we get more updates. And ever since there was no any issue in that house afterwards. Uh, it's amazing, you know, something, some, sometimes they only need a little push, you know. Um, we haven't seen any spirit, we haven't interacted with them, we haven't spoken with them, but just seeing a monk, if they saw, in that house, just seeing the services and seeing that a meal was offered was enough for them to, you know, be happy, to, to, to remind themselves of who they actually were and let go and, you know, go to a happier place. It's amazing. All right, so enough talking. Let's, uh, let's talk about death, <coughs> death rituals. So in Buddhist practice, you know, there's no such thing called last rites, you know. No, we don't do that. It is done in uh, non-Buddhist traditions, Christian traditions. And sometimes, you know, when deaths happen, I have uh, invited these uh, friends to make a circle and ask them to talk about good qualities of them. And I offer some prayers, of course, Christian prayers in, in, you know, in hospitals. I can do Buddhist prayers with them <laughs> to confuse these families. And they pray, they also, they join with prayers and that help. And I can see how relieved they are. But if I can get a priest, I will also do that so that they get the best services in that moment. So in, um, it depends on the you know, families. Sometimes uh, they choose to do certain acts, such as you know, releasing animals, birds, you know, fish, crabs uh, to, to the ocean. And they choose chanting. They would choose it, you know, this is called Pirit chanting, chanting of uh, safeguard recitals to earn merits. And they will do it by the death body. If it is, you know, if the deceased person is your parents, they would kneel down and bow and ask for forgiveness and make a promise, you know, saying, you have been a wonderful mother, wonderful father. You wanted us to live happily doing good things. And we promise that we will stay together and not let any bad influence on our families and we will continue to, um, to continue to do the services good things you have been doing so that makes them happy and we also uh, give three refuges and five precepts to those who have come to that place and it's done in Pali language um, and that way you come to purity in virtues in your sila so I, you know you may have not been keeping your precepts that well and at this moment taking precepts help you to uh, purify your mind and the chanting we do uh, we have a white cloth prepared this is that white cloth the cloth to make uh, robes later this is called mataka vastra Mem uh, sort of uh, the meaning of that is like a 
um, memory of cloth, cloth in memory of that person. And uh, the family will hold it and we monks chant, uh, I will chant it in Pali, but the meaning of it is in here. Uh, this is from the Buddha's words, formations truly, they are transient. It is their nature to arise and cease. Having arisen, then they pass away. Their calming and cessation is happiness. We chant it three times in, in families uh, by the dead body. And uh, allow me to chant now. <clears throat> Anicca Sankara Upad Vayadam Mino Upadjitva Nirujanti Te Sangup Samo Sukho Anicca Sankara Upad Vayadam Mino Upadjitva Nirujanti Te Sangup Samo Sukho Anicca Sankara Upad Vayadam Mino Upadjitva Nirujanti Te Sangup Samo Sukho So with this they will offer the white cloth to the monks and any monk can accept it and uh, at that moment we think that they are ready to listen to Dhamma. So we we give a little Dhamma talk, kind of unwrapping the meaning of it, you know, how impermanent are things, you know, we can't control um, their life and we need to let go, you know, and we need to make peace. Uh, things that arise in your mind pass away. This happens continuously and uh, letting things settle in your mind will bring you to peace and calmness. So I normally take an oil lamp for an example. Uh, so the light of an oil lamp can go away when the oil is finished or when the wick is finished or when a wind, sudden wind comes or when both the uh, oil and the wick are burnt. Just like that, you know, our lives end when, you know, karma, I, you know, ayu is over, which is lifespan. When it is over, we have to say goodbye. Then karma is over sometimes. That way we say goodbye. And sometimes both together ends, like ayu and karma both ends, and we say goodbye. And sometimes sudden deaths happen. It's like the candle, you know, getting getting blown away with uh, a high wind or something like that so we can't hold you know hold our hands to a lamp and say you know stay stay lit we can't say it and it doesn't stop just burns away or just vanishes at some point or suddenly the light disappears and we relate to that and try to understand, you know, such is life. You know, some young, some middle-aged, some elderly, they all have to say goodbye. When Visaka, one of the greatest supporters of the Buddha, visited the Buddha in the, during the middle, midday and asked, you know, said, um, she was kind of in wet clothes and the Buddha asked, you know, why are you, you know, sad and in bed clothes. And she's, you know, the book, she said, my granddaughter, one of my granddaughters died and I'm sad. And the Buddha asked, you know, how many have died in this entire city? She said, maybe thousands today. Did you feel sad? And she said, no. And the Buddha asked, why is that? Because they are not mine. 
So then the Buddha kind of reminded her, you know, whenever there is attachment towards someone, there we have sadness. If we are not attached to anyone, we don't have that sadness. You know, grief arises because of that attachment. We try to see that and catch that and let go. So in different uh, Buddhist traditions, in local customs, you know, also in Sri Lanka, like we found in that sutra, Tirokuddha Sutra, we say we pour water, you know, from from a cup to a, an empty cup and let it overflow, which is like merit overflowing in their life. And as they overflow, we say just as water rain on high ground moves to the low land, even so does what is given here benefit the dead. Just as the rivers full of water fill the ocean full, even so does what is given here benefit the dead. So we do something good and we transfer merits by pouring water like that. It's just like, it's like, um, <clears throat> like in a wedding ceremony, you give something precious by pouring water. Like in, in the Buddha's time when monasteries were offered by kings to the Buddha, they pour water to the Buddha's hand, symbol symbolically like giving the ownership to monks. So um, in China, there is a thing called Ghost Month. In in that, so they are they do number of rituals uh, in memory of dead. Um, so during this period, spirits of the dead are invited to the Buddhist monasteries to participate. So um, recitation of the name Amitabha uh, happens uh, or the scripture will be recited. In, in uh, Vietnam tradition, they have Ulamban ceremony. Uh, they invite monks, you know, and they, they do a series of good, good deeds and happy performances uh, in, in the memory of those de deceased relatives. Um, so this generates merits. So that is the Chinese culture. And uh, so they also, in the ghost month, they, pre they prepare yellow paper slips called lotus seeds. You see the slips on the wall. <clears throat> this is called the Hall of Rebirth. Um, so they state the name of the person and they dedicate, you know, this wall is dedicated for, for so many people. At the end of the ghost month, they, these papers are burned along with the paper money. So rituals in, uh, that's also done in Laos. So in Laos, um, so there's a paper slip uh, on the basket stating who it is for. And these baskets have fruits and items offered to monks. So they also call it the festival of baskets drawn by a uh, by lot by other people. So they do it together. Um, so they also make offerings in every culture. Um, they may offer to monks, so they may offer to orphans, they may offer to um, homeless, and, and they they may give to birds and say, honey, I do this for you. And that way you make a connection and you do something helpful to someone. And that happiness you share with, with, with somebody. So that's the end. Any questions in the last 10 minutes before I uh, wrap up for the day? You know, I've been sharing a lot and uh, I hope um, I covered pretty much what you wanted me to um, with that guided meditation and uh, this sharing. Anything else you want me to talk about, please, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Pante. You're welcome. Cindy had her hand up. Yes. Please unmute. Yes, but um, I'm, I'm quite ignorant about Terirada tradition. So I just wonder, um, is, is there a, a significant difference between Mahayana and Theravada 
because basically they are both teaching uh, Buddhist teaching uh, and then mm -hmm. the, all the Four Noble Truths, all those basic foundations are the same. But I just wanted to know in general, when we deal with the public, is there um, some major difference between Mahayana and Theravada that, that we should know about so then uh, we don't offend the, 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 the people that they, they think it was important, but we don't, we don't take care of it. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think uh, right there, we, we also heard the answer from you. You know, when it comes to Four Noble Truths, um, every branch of Buddhism Mm -hmm. has that as you know as the foundation you know mm -hmm. and the suffering and the origin of suffering the uh, cessation of suffering and ending um, so when you throw away the formats all these mm -hmm. Mahayana format Theravada format you know Tantrayana Vajrayana format the essence is similar <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and depending on different cultures different countries you will see the outfit different and a slight changes in belief. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, in some Mahayana uh, traditions, they believe that everyone can become Buddhas. Mm -hmm. So you are a Bodhisattva, mm -hmm. which is not uh, uncommon in Theravada tradition also that we all believe that uh, someday you can become enlightened, but mm -hmm. in Theravada tradition, not everybody aspires to become Buddhas. Mm -hmm. But Arahants, enlightened uh, monks, are also sometimes called Buddhas in Theravada tradition. So I see these slight conflicts between how terms are being used. You know, uh, if it makes as someone to become a bodhisattva, whatever the practices, like fulfilling ten perfections, such as giving, practicing loving kindness, mm -hmm. and practicing virtues, practicing effort, and all these bring you on the path to become a Buddha, I would support it, whether it is in Theravada tradition or in Mahayana tradition. And sometimes the chantings and the scripture are different too. So like some in some Mahayana traditions they use uh, Lotus Sutra, um, and uh, this is called Saddhamma Pundarika and many other sutras. And in them you find uh, uh, kind of an extension of what was there already, and and uh, it depends on what tradition you belong to. Sometimes without you knowing, you are born to a family that follows some Nichiren Buddhism. And you are like, you are comfortable with it. But if you are inquisitive enough, you will find these other variants, like, like different ice creams out there. And you will choose the best flavor that suits you. <laughs> to, to the enlightened monk, in Theravada, once they got enlightened and uh, do they retreat? Uh, because that I was told that uh, they will retreat instead of uh, uh, practice uh, uh, salvation or whatever you call it. In, in, in the world. <clears throat> Whereas in Mahayana, you're supposed to stay and, and carry it out with your compassion work. So I, to me, I, I couldn't really um, well, in terms I mean, it's of... It's a big difference. Yeah, it's a big difference in work. Yeah, but I just wonder from your... It depends on how they share that information with you. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, just imagine someone enlightened uh, being around you. They don't have lust in them. Mm -hmm. They don't have anger. Mm -hmm. So you must be so fortunate to associate someone who doesn't have anger. Mm -hmm. And how compassionate of them mm -hmm. to be around you, blessing you mm -hmm. um, in that sense that that is a service too, you know. There, although Katankarniya, what has to be done has been done in terms of their practice. But their existence, you know, like the Buddha, when he became enlightened, for 45 years he went from village to village, town to town. Practicing compassion. You yeah. see, therefore, it depends on how the message is delivered to you. And the individuals, sometimes they choose to 
uh, stay secluded, but oftentimes they stay with the community because for your survival, uh, community is you know, very helpful. Um, if you go into the deep jungles and uh, you may be like attacked by elephants or tigers and that will be it. But you rather stay teaching to a community or uh, staying silent in the community, but still you are a blessing to that community. Okay. So it doesn't matter what tradition they belong to. Okay, Four more you. minutes. <laughs> I, Four I, minutes. Just, I just wanted to um, add um, quickly to following what Cindy was uh, saying mm -hmm. the question. I recently came across a website by um, Bhante Dhammadipa. Um, before his he was um, his title is Vendama Deepa, and uh, he on his website he has one statement: "There's only one Buddhism, and mm -hmm. all the traditions and uh, uh, schools are mm -hmm. variations of it." I I really like that uh, the, the that statement. I think um, and um, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. But I also wanted to thank you because every time I attend one of those um, services and have you, your presence or Roshi's and the Venerable's presence, I feel like uh, it's hmm. utterly peace and uh, rejuvenating moments. So thank you. And, uh, yeah. You're welcome. Thank you so much for the kind words. I think that with that, we can wrap up. I think we did uh, so much work already. <laughs> yes. And um, yes, a lot. <laughs> May all beings be well and happy. May devas, the heavenly beings, protect you and guard you. Um, may the deceased find happy home in sansara may the suffering ones be suffering free 